Orcs are up there with dwarves and elves when it comes to your tried and true, widebred Tolkien expat races of D&D. And yet, somehow, they are not even a core race, replaced by their step cousins twice removed, the half orcs. And the reasons for this are complicated. And we're gonna talk about them. I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and we're gonna be explaining all the baggage that orcs and half orcs carry around the dragon game, and we're gonna give them a twist that you can take home to your own games in this brand new episode of D&D with a twist, Orc Edition. So when I think of orcs, I think of... Orc is the race for gym bros and professional himbos. And that right. So as I said, orcs are not even a core race, so I'm gonna discuss them, but I'm also gonna talk about half orcs when it comes to abilities and stuff, since those are the ones that people are most familiar with, you know, actually playing, since you couldn't play orcs for the longest time. I wonder why that is. Half orcs and orcs are the big buff green pea giants of D&D. They are the core race for those that seek to embody that big pauldron, World of Warcraft looking roid fueled big boy in their fantasy role playing. And their lore sort of reflects this in interesting ways. So let's take a look at them. Personality wise, orcs are said to be more prone to anger than other races. Oh boy. Preferring to go for a violent solution to every problem. Cool, cool, cool. Very normal and very cool. They're also described as stupid. The actual player race does not actually have like a negative for intelligence, but the orc stat block certainly does. Appearance-wise, orcs are not green in D&D, joining goblins in the Bad Decisions Club, with most of them being described as having grayish skin, black hair, and sort of pig-like appearance with boar tusks and upturned noses. Personally, I just translate this in my mind to the dungeon meshy look because it looks cooler. And also because official art looks like this. But usually I just make them green because it's better. But what about culture? Let's take a look. But let's not talk too loud while we do that. Someone may hear us. How? Through your computer, of course. Plenty of people have defended themselves from scrying through magical means, but those with ill intent in mind have found ways to bypass those safeguards. They gather your secrets and sell them to those that have use for them. Specific safeguards built with the express purpose of protecting information you hold dear must be implemented specifically against those that trade in secrets. Safeguards, like Incogni. Real talk, data collection scares me a lot. It's just a fact that people are actually selling your data to the highest bidder out there, and people don't buy stuff they don't intend to use. They're 100% using your data, which is why we now have to worry about actual data brokers. Like that's a thing that exists and that people dedicate their finite amount of time on earth to do. Great. You can technically opt out of this, this is how they make it legal, but it's extremely hard and extremely time consuming to do so. And even if you manage to remove yourself, they just add you back so you start all over again. This is why you get stuff like scan mails and phone calls and a bunch of other stuff. And that's where Incogni comes in. Incogni is a service that removes you and your data from hundreds of these lists that data brokers keep. They request your removal from their list automatically and deal with the aftermath if they run into any issues for you. More importantly, if your data is added to these lists again, which is very likely since this is how they keep this whole circus going, Incogni will automatically remove you again from the lists. It constantly monitors to see if it can find your data in these trading lists again, keeping your info away from the people that want to literally sell it. So if this sounds like an interesting and useful thing for you, which for me it is, I use it, I have a 60% off any of their annual Incogni plans for you. Yep, 60%. Once again, you know me and math, 60% is pretty big to me. So go ahead and check it out. Just go to incogni.com slash pointy hat. It's the very first link in the description. That's incogni.com slash pointy hat. And thank you to Incogni for sponsoring this video. And now that we're hopefully protected from spooky secret stealers, let's talk orcs. Orcish culture is traditionally unable to chill, with war playing a big role in how they go about living. They are structured in tribes, of course, because if you make an evil race in fantasy, it's either tribes or whatever the drow have going on. Orcs are led by a chieftain, led to what? To war, of course. Orcs favorite hobbies are war, armed conflict, fighting, scrapping, and of course, hit real good. With raiding being a big part of how orcs actually get their resources. In general, D&D orcs don't create, but rather, borrow without permission. Is that my ring? It is now. They go pay a visit to whoever has so rudely decided to live next to them, help themselves to their stuff, maybe give them a few pets with their access payment, and take back some souvenirs. Lovely. They don't build cities, not often, but either live in caves, bear style, or take over ruins of existing cities. Sometimes cities they helped become a ruin and just squat there. 
The cave part is relevant, as that is their natural habitat, or at least it is for the most popular orc subrace, mountain orcs. We'll get into why. As you can imagine, this whole burrowing based culture didn't help them win a lot of popularity contests, joining goblins in the Everyone Hates Me club of races that everyone hates. Everyone, but especially elves. Orcs and elves have been locked into a bloody conflict that has lasted millennia. These twink versus jock wars have claimed many a life. It started in earnest when orcs actually got to the D&D base world. Faerun. Faerun. Whatever. Yes, orcs are aliens. We don't have time to get into that. This video is already going to be long enough. I can just feel it. And they started fighting basically from the moment they stepped into the world, giving rise to the aforementioned Twink Jock Wars, or what lesser scholars who are not fun of parties call the Orc Gate Wars. And these conflicts have left a deep scar in the relations between the two races. But this runs way deeper than the Orc Jock Wars and goes right up to the gods of both orcs and elves. That's right, the elf creator god Corlon and the orc creator god Groomsh have been beefing since. Since time was a thing, I guess. The two races hold two wildly different accounts of what actually happened. You know, like children. Elves, of course, say that Grimsh started it, and orcs say, nah, -uh. it was Grimsh's turn on the Xbox, and Corallon started it. The actual problem came when the creator gods were doing what can only be described as a divine raffle to decide where the little blorbos they created, the DD races, would live. What the other gods, including Corallon, did to Grimsh during this divine raffle of ultimate destiny that will get to decide what place each race will get to call home is referred to by elves as a prank, which, you know, I, I wouldn't use the word prank seeing what was on the line, but sure. Basically, each creator god pulled out a ballot that would assign the place where their creations would live, with elves getting the woods, dwarves getting mountains, humans getting a European passport, and hobbits, I mean, halflings getting non-copyright infringing hills. And they just forgot to put a ballot in for Groomsh and his orcs. And none for Gretchen Wieners, bye. So orcs found themselves without a place to call home, and then they started to laugh at Groomsh. <laughs> I see we have graduated from six-year-olds fighting for the Xbox to Mean Girls tier beef. Really, really cool of them. Groomsh, seeing this, said, I didn't want to go to your stupid house party anyway, McKaylee. And then he took his spears and pierced a thousand holes in the world and declared that these will be the caves that orcs will get to live in. Pause. Honestly, sick creation myth. Good job to whoever wrote that. It's a cool story. But believe it or not, this is one of only many, many times Corallon and Groomsh have fought. They, they do that a lot. The girls are fighting! The big one is, once again, hotly debated as to how exactly it went down. Loth of all people is somehow involved, and this video isn't on God, so I'm not gonna get into it. Corallon and Groomsh went at it, and the other elf gods got involved, and Groomsh lost. If you believe the orcs, that was the end of it. But if you believe the elves, it was in this fight that Corallon tore out one of Groomsh's eyes, which is why he only has one. Give me a second eye. Bottom line here, Groomsh is evil and mean and violent and rude and ugly and bad, and so are orcs' natural tendencies. He's consumed with a need for revenge, which, you know, doesn't make for a great patron deity. Interesting thought there. Wonder what the implications of that are. Anyway, we've talked way too much about this inscrutable lore for my liking. You got the gist. Big bad mini zucchinis. Simple. But what can these guys actually do? It's time to look at those abilities. And let's start with half orcs since those guys are the core race ones. Let's go. If you're playing with ability scores, half orcs get a plus two to strength and a plus one to con. Super solid for literally anything strength based. And particularly good for tanky builds with that little con bonus. I normally don't talk about this, but an important note here is the age section, where it's said that half orcs mature faster than humans and live less, 75 years being sort of their maximum life expectancy. Why do I talk about this? Because I'm using it later. Anyway, and yet another reason to add to the ever-growing list of alignment being awful, half orcs were stated to inherit a tendency towards chaos from their orc parents and are not strongly inclined towards good. Cool, cool, cool. Give me just a second, guys. Okay, moving on. Size, quarterback, speed, normal, dark vision. One of the most justified races to get this, since most orcs live in caves, since... The incident? Okay, on to actually fun stuff. Menacing. You are intimidating. We're not gonna get into that. Proficiency in intimidation is cool, especially if you use the objectively good rule of being able to roll intimidation with strength. Riz only intimidation is stupid. Moving on. Relentless endurance. The signature ability of the half orc and honestly, their best one. Once a long rest, if you're bonked to below zero HP, you're not. You instead drop to one hit point. This is it. This is why half orcs make for such amazing tanks. Most racial abilities are situational at best, and relentless endurance is absolutely not that. You will see this pop up 
a lot. It's an incredibly good ability for everyone, but especially for tanks. Props to this. Savage Attacks is their sort of second signature ability, and this one is more situational, but still good. When you score a crit, you add one additional damage die. You can't really rely on crits since they are 100% random, but this will make them feel even more amazing when they do happen. Unfortunately, this is specifically stated to be only for weapon attacks, and therefore pigeonholes half orcs into martial classes even more. But hear me out, let me tell you a little secret, you can ignore this! Make this happen on spell attacks too, who cares? If you're the type to get rid of ability scores tied to your racial choice, like me, you can change this too. The D&D police can't get you at your own table, you're fine, you're safe. And that's it! Normally I proceed on to sub-races, but half-forks don't have any! At all! Pretty rare for a core race, really, what a shame! Well, let's put on an asterisk next to that. There's technically one, one of the Eberron Mark ones, but those basically don't feel like sub-races at all and are more like backgrounds and are super setting dependent, so I'm not gonna get into it. We'll make an Eberron video. Someday, maybe, I don't know, scream in the middle of your garage or in the comments if you want that. I feel like the ship has sailed since the book has been out for ages now, but anyway, since we have no sub-races to talk about, let's talk about the Half-Orcs daddies. Or mommies. Or parents. I don't judge. Let's take a quick look at Orc abilities. Believe it or not, D&D orcs have gone through three different versions of the playable race. In all of D&D? <laughs> no. In 5e alone. Yep, and honestly, it's a great way to see how the game has evolved in its design philosophy when it comes to fantasy races. They were introduced in Vala's Guide to Monsters, then we got the Eberron version of them, and then we got the Morden Kanan iteration. Even leaving Eberron out of it since it's a completely different setting, orcs got abilities like Aggressive, which lets you chase people like a mole cop, and Primal Intuition, which gives you proficiency in a bunch of skills, some of them making sense with like an intuition ability, but I don't know, I are they intuitively practicing medicine? Sounds like the people peddling healing crystals through Facebook Marketplace. Morning Kanan's version of the Orcs is inherently better because it doesn't have any alignment mess and you get to put your ability scores wherever, like God intended, but also because their abilities are just plain better and more versatile. Adrenaline Rush allows you to take the dash action as a bonus action, and whenever you do this, you get temp HP equal to your proficiency bonus. This is so much better than aggressively jazzercising towards your enemy because tanky builds can use this to tank, but bruisers can also use this for positioning and increasing survivability, and casters can use this to get away and stay alive. Much more versatile. Powerful build increases your carrying capacity so you don't have to make two trips after grocery shopping, and they get relentless endurance, which, as we have already established, is one of the best racial abilities in the game. Do you notice something? That's right, none of these abilities pigeonhole the orc into one specific role. The orc is literally a more versatile racial option than the half-orc. Once again, change in design philosophy. So you can very much make a very competent orc caster, giving you more options, which, you know, is just plain better for the game, no matter what mental gymnastics you want to do about it. Cool, so we've looked at orc lore, orc abilities, half-orc abilities, and all that is well and good. But what if we want to give orcs a new twist? So you want to play an orc. You know how hard I work to get here? I put in too many hours. I sweat too much blood. Or a half orc. You know how hard I work to get here? I put in too many hours. I sweat too much blood. Orcs are the absolute units of D&D, and they are also not conceived as a playable race at all. If you've seen my goblin video, you're familiar with this notion. Orcs, just like goblins, were not supposed to be something you play. They were supposed to be something you throw into a wood chip. It's the reason why half-orc is the core race and not orc. Orcs were meant to be big scary guys that are all evil and all bad and so you don't feel bad about running them over with a lawnmower. <laughs> and that's fine, I guess, but they haven't stayed like that. People want to play orcs. The needs of the game have changed and so has its design. And orcs needed to change with them. And we're like, halfway there. The moment you want people to be able to play these guys, or tell more interesting stories involving orcs other than And then we went into the spooky cave and we killed all the ugly ugly orc minis and found lots of cool stuff and cool swords and then we got out. Orcs needed to grow from the original role of video game mob you plow through that they started at and D&D has slowly but surely gone in that direction. Now, I'm not here to make a value judgment on whether all orcs forever in every game should have interiority 
and be allowed to be individuals at every table. If you want to just have some mindless fun hitting big mean green bean giants, have at it. Although I guess you're already changing them if you make them green. You know what, that's not the point. I'm not gonna get hang up on the green thing. Moving on. I don't even think that having orcs as this uncomplicated bad guy is a bad thing necessarily. Coding notwithstanding. Not every table has to have orcs sitting around arguing on the merits of postmodern hedonism versus stoicism as they adjust their glasses at each other, as hot as that may be to me. But as the game evolves and more and more people want to give these guys a go as adventurers, the game needs to account for that and allow for orcs to be complex and actual individuals for those that want to use them like that. It's about giving the option for complexity, the option for different stories. The catch here is how do you do that? Just like goblins are fun because the identity, the concept behind the race is a little raccoon that walks on two legs and loves chaos, orcs have a clear identity behind them that people have grown accustomed to and love. The game makes orcs evolve to adapt to the needs of a growing game, which is a sign of a healthy game by the way, but retconning all of the orc lore and doing away with their identity without any care of what was already established in order to make them all about I don't know, competitive epicureanism is, in my opinion, not the way to go. And I think that's a shame. And I don't know, we can do better. So we have a complicated task ahead of us. We need to make a way for people to play an orc or tell stories around orcs that is not always an evil guy that is inherently evil because all orcs are destructive evil idiots. But we have to also leave space for that to also be an option for people that want to run orcs like that. Like a video game mob. Tough stuff. When I did this with goblins, I leaned on existing goblin lore that explained that goblins are basically a stolen race from the Feywild taken by a conqueror god that is not their original god. So I chose to develop a race that got away from that god's control and stayed in the Feywild. What? That video, by the way, people really like the brownies and they are a personal favorite of mine. But I can't do that here. Groomsh is the god of orcs and changing that would be retconning. And that's for cowards. And I'm not a coward. And I've already explained why that's not what I'm after. So what do? Well, what if we lean into the existing lore of Groomsh? There's a lot to pull from. What if, hear me out, we finally give an answer of who was right in the Jock vs. Twink Wars, at least originally. What if we make it so that, gasp, yes. Groomsh was right originally, and his anger was justified, but something happened to make him what he is today, this crazed maniac hellbent on revenge. What if we make it so that's not his natural state, that's not who he truly is? What if the elven story of Groomsh losing his eye is the true one, but he didn't just lose his eye, he lost his essence as a creator. God. Let's go. Much has been said about the fateful day when the creator deities divided the world to give a home to their races. What has been lost from memory is the reason why Groomsh's children were cheated out of a place to call home. Groomsh wanted the forest for his orcs to live, as they needed them most, but Corlon wanted the same thing for their children, and so the scheme to trick Groomsh was set in place. This betrayal planted the seed of vengeance in Groomsh's heart. But this did not make that seed consume the god in its entirety. The fateful fight between Corlon and Groomsh did. When Corlon dealt the final blow to Groomsh in that battle, it not only destroyed Groomsh's eye, but Groomsh's essence. Corlon, being the god of not just elves, but also magic, laced his sword in a magical poison, just like Lolth laced Groomsh's spear. But Corlon's poison did not target the body, it targeted the mind. When the sword pierced Groomsh's eye, it also pierced his psyche, maiming it forever. Groomsh, the caring father of all orcs, lost everything that made him himself, consumed only by the strongest emotion he felt at the moment that he lost his eye and his mind. And at that moment, and ever since his children were deprived of their homes, the strongest feeling Groomsh felt was revenge. This maiming destroyed Groomsh as the orcs and all other gods knew him. He was no longer the father to all orcs, but a killing machine, hell-bent on revenge against Corlon, willing to sacrifice the children he loved so much in the process. Groomsh no longer sought retribution and his children's rightful home. He lost his status as a creator god, turning into a godlike monster, a being that could only think of revenge without justice or sense. Losing the protection of their creator god changed orcs irreparably. The reason why Grimsh was so incensed when his children were left without a place to call home is because it was in the orcs' nature to live in verdant forests, the domain Corlon also wanted for their own children. 
banished from the forest that were to be their homes, and confined to the dark caves that Grooms made with his spear. Orcs lost their ability to feed off of the sun. Orcs being caught from the essence of the creator god reduced their lifespan. Their verdant skin was drained of color, turning gray and lifeless. They became a shadow of what they were created to be. But these are not the only things that orcs lost along with Grooms. The title of creator is not given to a god lightly. The blessing of a creator deity allows the children of this deity the power to create themselves. Groomsha's maiming maimed the orc's ability to create. Crops wilt when an orc tends to them. Livestock is unruly. Metal refuses to smelt correctly. Everything an orc tries to make is made weaker by Groomsha's maiming. This is why orcs are relegated, most often, to pillaging. They have to survive off of the creations of other races, as they cannot create themselves. Groomsh, in his current state, only allows orcs to reproduce to strengthen the number of his army he intends on using in the eternal war he's been locked into. But Groomsh, even in his current main state, loves his children too dearly to let them languish, orphaned of their divine father. A small part of who Groomsh truly is, behind that crazed need for revenge and Corlon's poisonous spell, remains within the god. And that part fights against its own psyche, reaching out towards his children. Much like humans change into tieflings due to fiendish influence, the orcs that the true Grooms manages to touch form a connection to their creator. Their skin regains its natural green glow once more, as it always was intended to, giving them the name of Verdant Orcs. Verdant Orcs are blessed by their father, and represent what orcs can be while under the protection of a creator deity. Though few and far between, their numbers are ever-growing, as more and more of them are either birthed or awakened by Grooms himself. Verdant Orcs seek the home that was owed to them, creating orcish groves deep within forest away from the eyes of all. You might think that their culture is one of revenge and hatred against elves, and that could not be further from the truth. Verdant Orcs have seen what revenge has done to their father, and they will not follow that path. Instead, their path is one of calm and calculated need for justice. They will grow their numbers until they are powerful enough to heal their father, curing his maiming, and once done so, they'll claim the rightful place in the world, for Groomsh's children are nothing but strong, persistent, and numerous. Ha! You thought I was going to let go of that greenskin thing. Think again. I think that's cool. Making Groomsh a kind creator deity that was twisted into what he is today makes it so that orcs can stay exactly as they are, but also gives a reason as to why they are the way that they are. And more importantly, an option to play them differently with like an actual reason why. And also, even more importantly, gives you so many stories to tell. I am not in the business of killing gods in campaigns because I think that's just a bit too much, but I am definitely in the business of healing gods. Imagine that campaign story, bringing Grooms back to his uncorrupted state, healing him, helping the orcs find a rightful place. Would you play that? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I would. It sounds sick. It tracks with a bunch of existing orc lore, even down to orcs not even saying Groomsh's name out loud unless they are a priest of Groomsh. This could be because Groomsh having a literal poisonous effect on orcs in his current state, and those that get too close to him are taken over by his need for revenge. It also makes Corallon a little bit more interesting than just, she's nice. I mean, what he did was pretty messed up, but he did it to give his own children a place in the world. It just so happened that the orcs also needed that same place as elves. That's drama, baby. I mean, regardless of if you like it or not, you gotta admit that making the reason why orcs are green be literal chlorophyll to be at least original. They are currently gray because they were relegated to live in caves and they lost their green coloration. I don't know, that's the sort of world building I love. It's just a shame that Vernon orcs are just not a thing. So you can't really put them in your campaigns, or much less play one. Oh, what's that? You feel a divine presence calling you? Calling you to use the verdant orcs? Like Groomsh calls to them. Well, my child, it is no other divine presence than mine! Indeed, my childreneth, in my infinite glorieth, I have it madeeth the verdant orcith, and it's for thee to use. Thus saith the hat. Yep, the Vernon Orc and their lore and their everything you ever need to put them in your games or play one, including art made by yours truly, is in the description of this very video you're watching and it's for 100% certified pointy hat free. Praise be! But what if orcs are not your thing? What if this whole video was orc propaganda and you are an elf simp? A Pfizer. Welp, here's this ancient video on elves, and it has two elf subspecies for you to use. And if this whole Grooms thing has piqued your interest in starting your own campaign, how about this video on how to do exactly that? Hope you like it!
Mwah!